So we're in the book of Genesis, chapter 39 is our text. If you would take your Bibles and turn there, please. If you don't have your Bibles, there are pew Bibles underneath the pew. And as you are turning there, let me just remind you where we've been in previous episodes of the Joseph narrative. So Joseph was a young man and was favored by his dad who gave him a multicolored, very expensive, lavish robe. He wore it, pranced around in front of his brothers and created a lot of problems. And so the brothers are jealous that they hate him. They hate him all the more. They want to kill him, but instead they end up selling him to a passing caravan headed for Egypt. Instead of a dead brother, they make money off his, their own brother. It's a particularly heinous kind of a sin that they create against their brother. And when you think about how they tore the robe off and they dipped it into the blood of a goat and took it back to the dad and said, Daddy, we're sorry to, uh, you know, we think we know what happened to our brother that he was killed by an animal, a wild animal, and this is all that we have left of him, the father. This is his favorite son. He's got, he's got 11 sons at this moment, and this is his favorite son, and he weeps, and it's just a terrible, terrible thing. It reminds me that certain things just don't change, and we've been seeing these things in the book of Genesis in a lot of different stripes and fashions, but there's something called the seven deadly sins. I don't know exactly which order you put them in. I think the P always goes first for pride. C.S. Lewis said it was the most damnable of all sins because it keeps us from recognizing and admitting that we have a need which keeps us from having a savior. But there are other of the sins such as envy, jealousy, there is anger. We certainly see envy and anger with the brothers, don't we? that they were envious of Jacob, or of Joseph, and that they were angry at him, and it says that they hated him. They hated him all the more, and they hated him all the more, three times. It says that they hated their brother. There's anger to the point that they would murder him. And so we know that this is truly a deadly sin. All of these things, envy and anger and pride, we see these with the boys. Well, we also see there is a fourth one, and we're gonna see that in just a moment, her name is Mrs. Potiphar, the L is for lust. We also see the sense of greed that the boys didn't kill their brother, they sold him because they were greedy. And they thought, well, why kill him? Why waste the opportunity? Let's get something back from it other than just the satisfaction of killing our obstinate brother. There's also gluttony. And what is the last one? Sloth. It always goes last, at least when I do this. So in looking at this, it's just a, it's a fascinating story because I think five of the seven are mentioned here, pride, envy, anger, lust, and greed. And uh, it's just, this is part of the human condition. And so we see that there are going to be a couple of reasons that Joseph, first of all, was put into a pit and then he's put into prison. I'm going to use those terms interchangeably here that he's in the pit. And so with that, with those, those, those things, there are reasons that he gets in the pit. Number one is the sense that his brothers put him in it. They were the ones that put him in the pit to begin with uh, earlier in chapter 39. And uh, we also see that Mrs. Potiphar is responsible for him being unjustly served and being cast into prison. And we're gonna read that text in just a moment. But I remind you that it was very important. It was Joseph's brothers and Mrs. Potiphar that put Joseph in the pit. You gotta hear this. It was not God who put him in the pit. And there's a lot of people that are gonna have things happen to them and immediately they go to the blame game and it's always God's fault. And I wanna say, no, no, here it is. There are these things that are happening, that there is sin in the world and it's spread to everyone. Everyone's sin, we've all got this. Sometimes it's our fault. Sometimes it's the fault of somebody else. Sometimes it is inexplicable. We don't know why we got in the pit. Live long enough 
you get in the pit. Some form or fashion, you get there. Pits vary in size. I mean, they're great big pits. Sometimes they're little bitty pits. The wrong thinking is, there's one pit for my whole life. Well, there may be a big pit for your whole life, but let me tell you, in some ways, every day are pitfalls. There are struggles that we have because really when you think about a pit, it's about loss. Think of the pits that you've been in in life and isn't always connected with loss. You lost your job. Uh, you lost out to a sibling in some form or fashion. Uh, you lost in love and you got divorced. Uh, you lost in love and are a widower or a widow. You've lost a relationship. You lost a friend because they betrayed you. Jesus knew about that. That's what happens is that there is loss. And let's also flip that around and say that it's not only them that does these things to us. Sometimes we do it to ourselves. And sometimes we do it to other people. We tend to minimize that and don't see our own culpability. But this is what we want to talk about today. We want to talk about the pits, how you get there, who puts us there, how do we get out is the main thing. So that's where we're going today in response to the reverence we have in our heart for the Word of God. Let's stand as we read. This is chapter 39, the book of Genesis, verses 19 through 23. Let's read it together. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, this is the way your servant treated me, his anger was kindled, and Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Thank you. You may be seated. And join with me as we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So you've got a cast of characters. You've got Potiphar here. And Potiphar is the, is the bodyguard. Uh, he's one of the higher-ups with uh, Pharaoh. And it strikes me that, if, that he must not have believed, really, the word of his wife, or he would have had, because he knew how to do this, he, not, he knew how to execute prisoners. But he didn't do that. Instead, he just had Joseph put in prison, which makes me think, hmm, he probably smelled a rat here. So maybe this, we don't know. We don't know if, if Joseph was attracted to Mrs. Potiphar. We don't know, but she was persistent, and, and he was able to uh, avoid that temptation. So we, we've got to give him credit for hanging on to his own sense of dignity, righteousness, and self-worth. And he said, I'm not going to do this. I cannot do this against my master. This would be a great sin. And so we know that any time that we sin, that we engage in these kinds of behaviors, it's not going to work out well. There are always consequences. Short-term, we like it. Long-term, consequences. And so... Potiphar is somebody that is powerful, uh, could have done, taken a different course. The story could have been over and done with because Joseph could have been executed. So we also see with Joseph that it's very instructive. I don't know if you caught it while we were reading the text, but how often it talks about the Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. And this becomes kind of the narrative of Joseph's life. And that's why, as I said previously, how much I love the Christmas message of Emmanuel, God is with us. What a wonderful message that is. God is with us. And not just with the big guys, the important people. God is with every one of us. And we have the presence of God through the Holy Spirit, so we're never, ever alone. So this is the dynamic that's taking place, is that, that 
these things, these factors are entering into it, but in no way, because of this, does it mean that what is on the wall here is not true. God is good all the time. So we've got to hang on to that. And the reason for this series, why are we talking about this and why are we going this in this particular direction is because of my plea for you to develop a theology of suffering. You must have a theology of suffering. You've got to figure out how this makes sense. Why do these things happen? And if you don't have a theology of suffering, you're going to end up blaming God and saying this is God's fault. And this is probably the number one reason why people do not believe in God or say they do not believe in God is because they do not have an understanding of suffering. We assume life should always be good and happy and pleasant and fun. And if it's not all of those things and we have problems, we forget to look at the cause of this and then we begin to say, well, God must not care. A lot of times we will do that and that we will project onto other people, oh, they must be suffering, they must be hurting, and we say, well, there must be no God or he wouldn't allow them to hurt, he wouldn't allow them to suffer, when in fact, a lot of times, it's through suffering that we really develop our strength. It's through the lifting of the weights that we build muscle. And some people say, oh, that's too hard, I don't wanna do that, and they never build muscle. Suffering is a way that we build muscle. It's tension, it's pressure, but it builds if we respond in the right way. So this is taking place in Joseph's life. I don't think he was like, oh good, this is great. You know, this is wonderful, but the Lord was with him. And we gotta hang on to that. The Lord is with us, even though life is going to be a series of struggles, of ups and downs. Life is going to be a series of problems, and we have to learn how to solve them. Otherwise, we end up with a pity party, right? And so we see here these things are taking place. We've talked about the brothers. Mrs. Potiphar, the, uh, uh, the woman from L, if I can uh, call her that, uh, Mrs. Potiphar uh, introduces this wonderful gift that God has given to us, human sexuality. And it is a wonderful thing, and we should all celebrate it because were it not for that gift, none of us would be here today. So, but we've also got to say, this is one of those things, it's a wild card. And increasingly in our culture, in our society, this thing is running off the rails. And that's why this movement called the Me Too movement emerged, because it seems like every day there was a new allegation against a politician or an athlete or an entertainer, it's even come into churches, that people said, I've been abused. And that's what happened to Joseph, that he was abused, that he was harassed. And we gotta say, you gotta listen to those stories. You've gotta believe people, you gotta listen to that. Now there's a lot of issues dealing with human sexuality. If I were to say that's the number one reason people end up in pits, this may be it, dealing with sex and it just has all kinds of consequences. Uh, and that's what Paul says, that when you violate the connection that we have, that, that God has ordained a certain way for us to relate to others sexually, and that when we get outside of that, we have problems. Paul said that, it's a, that, that when you sin sexually, you sin against your body, you sin against another person as well. So this is a, is a, is a very devastating thing. We're seeing that in our culture. We had somebody that came and spoke at Asbury last year uh, to a group of they invited pastors and therapists and counselors. And so I went to the session and the topic, and I got the book, the guy that, uh, that spoke on this topic was on pornography. And he talked about how it can be used to, it, it had a different connotation, a different form. Now it comes in, in ways that you can have it uh, anonymously, that you can have it cheap. You can have all of these things and yet it is rewiring the brains of people and all kinds of things are developing here. And that this is a great struggle in our culture and that people get wired and programmed through pornography. 
This is a great danger, and we need to be aware of this. And so, so lust and sexual sin, uh, it's prevalent, it's in the culture, and it's kind of ironic because our culture is saying kind of, well, as long as you're a consenting adult, then everything's okay. Just do whatever you want to do. And then we're having all of these problems, and the Me Too movement comes up. It's like we have no set of brakes. We have no steering wheel, just a gas pedal. Watch out. You're going to go over the cliff. And so we see this now unfolding in our culture. So these seven deadly sins overwhelmingly are the reasons why. This is not God's will that these things happen. But nevertheless, there is a sense of loss. When these things smack us, we have a sense of loss. And so that sense of loss may be a relationship. It may be somebody that has let us down. It may be our health. And we talk about getting in the pit. Depression. Emotional health. And so we see these things really coming to fruition in a lot of different ways. Sometimes you'll never understand why you got in the pit, but there are certain things I think we can do to get out of the pit. I do this kind of tongue in cheek. So if I'm in the pit, how do I get out? And I say, well, number one, avoid it. That's real helpful, isn't it? I'm in the pit, so how do I get out? Don't get in the pit. <laughs> Thanks a lot, you know? But that is, this is based on the idea that there is just one pit. And that's what you've got to understand. I need to build character in my life now because there's going to be a pit in my future. It may be health. It may be emotional health. It may be finances. It may be a job. It may be like, you know, you have big pits and little pits. So this week, Dana and I, we kind of fell in a pit together this week because our granddaughters are moving from Elk City, Oklahoma to Denver. Aww. Yeah. Worthless son-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> so you hear that, and what's the response? Oh, Denver's a nice place. Yes, it is. But it's, we, you know, it's not that us going there is the problem, but how do you bring a three-year-old and a one-year-old to our house for you know, a week, and we just, I mean, that's just, that's the way life is. It's a series of good news and not so good news. That's the way life is. And you just have to build character. You have to anticipate this. So this is one of the reasons I want you to come to church every Sunday, unless there is a reason you know God would approve for you not to be here. I talked to somebody yesterday. It's their birthday. They're watching online. Happy birthday. Uh, but they said, you know, I've, got a, I've, I've had some health issues and, and I don't want to slip on the ice. I said, absolutely. That's a reason God would approve. And so I'm glad that we have the resources that we do. But you need to be in church. Because being in church will hold you accountable. You meet some friends. You get some opportunities. How you avoid the pits? You come to church. And it's going to expose you to a different element than... Staying at home, reading the Tulsa World, sipping your coffee. You need to be here because we're all going to have these struggles and we need one another. And so coming to church is a way that you build Christian friends. So this is important. Avoid it. Avoid it because it's coming and get prepared for it and so that I don't get there again. So that's the strategy. Second. I think that it's, it's really important that when we go through this, that we, that we uh, are folks that are very much focused on the present. You've heard that saying. It's hard to talk and write at the same time. Live in the present tense. You've heard the saying that yesterday's history, tomorrow's a mystery, today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. And so Paul talked about this, and he talked about how that he'd learned the secret of being content. What happens is that we allow our past, either we rest on our laurels or we feel guilty, or we lean into the future and we begin to feel anxious. I've got to confess, I'm feeling a little bit of anxiety about going to general conference on Friday. So that's coming up. How do I stay focused in the present moment 
of being with you at this time? How do I look you in the eye and not think about yesterday, not think about my sadness, my tears of my granddaughters and their worthless son-in-law taking them away from us? How do we focus on those, those good things in the moment? And that's why things like, you know, being involved in, you know, you go over and you have a donut, whatever, and you look at, you greet people, you meet people, you look them in the eye. That's one of the problems we're having with our phones, is everybody's got their head down. You need to turn the phone off and look up and see people, greet people. So be in the present tense. And that's what he says, learn in whatever state I am to be content. And then he says two verses later in Philippians 4.13, I could do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Third is that we want to help others. I love our mission statement because it says, helping others follow Jesus. That's what we want to do. If you'll listen to that statement, that mission statement, it has nothing to do with me, I, mine, myself. It's about helping others follow Jesus. Help others follow Jesus. And there's so many wonderful things that happen when we help other people follow Jesus. And so we can avoid, we can be present, we can help others follow Jesus. And I am so delighted by the things I hear about at Asbury, the things that are, that are taking place. Uh, the mission, the uh, kids going on, the spring break missions is a, is a catalyst for their faith development. Uh, this past Tuesday night, I think I heard that there were 420 widows that came to a Valentine's Day event uh, put on somebody, not because she was a widow, but because she just felt that burden. She, she felt a, a heart for widows and wanted to do something. And so this has probably been going for about six years and it's been building and building. And it's a way in which we want to say to our widows, you're not forgotten. We remember you and we love you and we care for you. And there's ways for you to build strength in your life. And here's, here's a way we could do that. 10 years, a second Saturday. And we celebrated that last Saturday. This afternoon, there's going to be a Ukrainian church that meets here in our one of our classrooms. I'm so delighted that we have this spot on Thursday mornings, and we'll probably have 800 women that come for uh, the Bible study fellowship. And it just goes on and on and on of how we help others follow Jesus. And sometimes it's just by being a community center and opening our facility to let other groups come. Tomorrow, I'm going to be doing a memorial service over in the chapel. We, it's the, the building is closed tomorrow. But I said, no, this is a great opportunity for us to open it up and to serve somebody in our community. We will do that, and we will do that well. And so this is who we are. We're trying to help others follow Jesus because we know that there is a pit that is prevalent in everybody's life. And we want to be able to say, we'll help you. We're, we're here. We're not here to judge you. We're not here to condemn you and say you shouldn't have gotten in the pit, how, how awful you are. We don't shame people, but we offer them a way out. Fourth, and finally, I would say be patient. Just be patient. Be patient with other people. Be patient with yourself. Be patient with the Lord comes out of the Revised Standard. I memorized it as kind of a life verse for me. Psalm 40, verses 1 through 3. I waited patiently upon the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up out of the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure put a new song into my mouth, a song of praise unto our God. Many shall see and fear and put their trust in God. I waited patiently upon the Lord. I think that is not written by Joseph, but it's something that would have applied to him. Psalm 40, 1 through 3. It's interesting to look in Psalm 40 and follow up later in the text. Guess what happens? He's back in the pit again. I kid you not, it's in there. That's life. 
That's what the church is. Extending a hand to somebody else that's in the pit. And by helping other people take our eyes off ourselves. I heard somebody say that one of the things that they've learned in life that actually came from her dad, and she said that uh, her dad learned that when somebody comes up and says, uh, hey, are you going to be doing anything for vacation, you know, that her dad learned that the reason the person was asking the question was because they were going to be doing something for vacation. So rather than saying, yes, yes, blah, 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 this is what I'm going to do, he learned how to say, well, not much, but how about you? And in doing so, big conversation. Guess what happens? Creates a bond because everybody wants to talk about their own self. And so this is a way we help other people. Stephen ministers, we listen. We don't talk, we listen. We care. Be patient. Be patient with others. Joseph was in a pit. He didn't need condemnation. He needed grace. And there was somebody else who went into the pit for us who did not deserve it. And if you go to Jerusalem, there's a place called St. Peter of Galicantu. That's where it means it's Latin for the cock crows. And that's the place, the tradition is that this is where Peter denied Jesus and the rooster crowed. But if you go to that site, you'll see down below a pit. And when I take folks there, we go down into that pit and we read from Psalm 88. And in that pit, it talks about how I'm in this pit, I am in this place. But God's with me and God's gonna redeem me. Jesus moved into the pit for us that we might have life. I don't know where you are. I, in a way, every one of us have some pitfalls in life. Some of us may really be struggling right now and that may be the person sitting next to you or behind you or beside you. You never know and that's why it's so important that when we come together that we offer grace and maybe we ask the questions, how are you? And really listen instead of rushing on to tell them how we are. I remind you, we're the church and we're the church because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, that he went into the pit for us. He suffered on behalf of our deadly sins so that we might have life. And this is the gift of God. As we go through this communion liturgy, there's that one line that I love so very much. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Dig into that and feel his peace, feel his grace, feel his power. This invitation is for you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. Thank you, Tom.